Hello everyone, I hope you're all safe, happy and well and enjoying your conference today. It's a great privilege for me to be here and I'd like to thank the organisers for asking me again. Um, over these past few years I've spoken at three school nursing conferences now. The um, uh, School Nursing International Conference and then one earlier at the RCN and now this one. And although I've never been a school nurse myself, um, I'm in regular contact with school nurses. Uh, for one reason, I run um, a research methods course and a top of MA that lots of school nurses attend. The research methods course is on our postgraduate diploma for Skiffin uh, uh, professionals, so whether health visiting, school nursing or district nursing. So I've constantly got uh, school nurses there and then across so many of the sexual health modules that I run as well. So whenever I'm asked to do presentations like this, the first thing I do is get in contact with so many of these school nurses and all of those that um, uh, relate with me on Twitter. And there are whole loads of you there, so thank you. Um, I contact so many of you and ask, what is it you think I should be talking about at this uh, uh, particular conference for this presentation? And one of the big issues coming up at the moment is around uh, relationship and sex education, and especially from the point of view of the way in which so many of you are or are not being commissioned around this. So that's what we'll be looking at now throughout this presentation. So first of all, let's look at some of the issues around uh, um, provision and your involvement in it. And what so many of you have told me is that there are differences and difficulties around commissioning. And especially in England, not necessarily just here, but especially in England, because of the way commissioning is happening, um, whereas you might have been providing SRE, Sex and Relationship Education, or having an input into it, maybe at the moment that's not happening uh, because of the way in which uh, services are now being dealt with. But it's really important that you keep um, a proactive approach to your own education and training around sexual health. And you'll see why as I progress through this presentation for you. But so many of you are still having to pick up when things go wrong, as I've written it here. So when you're offering your um, uh, drop-in sessions, for example, maybe that's when you're having the one-to-ones with in individual students and that's when they're telling you that things have gone wrong. So rather than you having a proactive role in their education, hopefully preventing things from going wrong, uh, because that element is no longer available to you, you are still having to pick up when things go wrong. And uh, what the commissioning problems can also lead to is the fact that if you're not commissioned to deliver relationship and sex education, then you may not have the time or the budget um, to be able to carry on your own education around this, which means that you will become de-skilled in it. It's imperative that you keep on developing your knowledge around RSE because there may come a time where hopefully you will be recommissioned again. And that's what I'm going to explore with you now over the next few minutes. Now, I wanted to, to use this theme of glancing backwards to look forward because I've been really fortunate to take part in some research with the Higher Education Policy Institute. M Michael Natzler was the lead author on this, and I've contributed on this report. It's freely available to all of you if you go to the HEPI website. And that research was conducted in August of 2020, and it was asking undergraduate students um, all sorts of questions around their own relationships, sex, sexual education, and sexual health. And so many of the questions look back to when they themselves were in school. So this is a look back on the former sex and relationship education, which theoretically should be getting better now because RSE is meant to be compulsory uh, uh, for, for schools, but there are still problems around even saying that word compulsory, because look how parents might still be able to withdraw young people from these sessions. 
um, and therefore particular schools may not be providing the full quality and equality of learning for all of their pupils. But this report was actually focusing on undergrad students, asking them to think back. And these are some of the key issues that I'd like to highlight with you from that report. So when the students looked back, uh, there were 1,004 of them who took part in the research, and there are six particular areas I'd like to address with you now at the moment. First of all, so many of them said that formal sex and relationship education in school did not prepare them well for sex and relationship um, when they were questioned about this at university. So around half of the students... Um, disagreed with the fact that sex and relationship education actually prepared them for what the future was bringing for them. So that's one important message. But also, so many of the students said that they learned more online um, about sex and relationships than they did from formal sessions within schools. Now, there were some differences in the responses as well, because Whereas some people say, well, what they learnt online might have been a help or may not have been a help for them. And some were saying, yes, they learned more online than in school. There were some internal differences amongst the students as well. So, for example, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and other minority students often found that they learnt more online especially if they were questioning about their sexual identities or their gender identities, a lot of them learned more online than they actually did from formal SRE within schools. And equally so for people with different types of disabilities as well. They found that they were accessing maybe specific sites concerning various disabilities and sexual health, um, so they were learning more than was being provided in schools. I'll come on to porn in a moment, but some of them said that they did learn, uh, you know, they learned about their sex relationships from watching porn. And obviously there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation that can go on there. And there were also safeguarding issues. So whether that was young people sharing um, um uh, sexual images of themselves, so sexting, for example. There were lots of ways in which safeguarding um, had to be taken into consideration. So that's another important point, because so many of you have, have got education and skills around safeguarding that maybe others haven't got. So that's another strong point for yourselves. Now, when it came to looking at porn, so many of them said that they did learn more about sex from pornography. But any of the studies you look at around this uh, make you question, well, what did they learn? Especially the ways in which there may be negative approaches to body image or um, the ways in which males dominate over females, uh, the way that there's sexual violence going on in some porn. So when people say that they've learned more about sex and relationships from porn, you really have to question, well, what is it that they've learned? But one thing that we may be able to learn from this is do we need to eroticize sex education? So many of the respondents in this study actually said that they found sex ed in school too pathological, too biological, too reproductive orientated, the stuff that people have been saying for decades. So maybe it's about time that when we're thinking about sexual health promotion, do we need to start making sex ed a bit more sexy? Okay, so that's a really important point for us, so that they're not going to think that it's boring and dull and dismal, but they're actually going to find that they don't need to access porn to learn about things. If we can make it meaningful to them, um, obviously in legal ways, uh, but, but ways which are going to uh, make sex a little bit more interesting for them. But one of the big aspects for you um, as a school nursing ser service is around um, a half of the students express positive responses on being able to ask for advice and help and to know that this is confidential. So obviously this has a real big impact on your own drop-in services that when young people do want to talk about particular issues, especially with areas of concern, that they know that you do provide confidential service and that you can signpost them on to other confidential services. 
In preparing this presentation, I also contacted um, quite a few of my friends and colleagues working in sexual health services, and I asked them what they've been experiencing over this uh, uh, COVID uh, lockdown era in relation to young people. And most of them in lots of their clinics have said, well, obviously they're seeing a lot fewer people come through the doors. So, so many services went over onto online provision, especially for asymptomatic people. So, so there, that's new developments. So looking at ways in which to get sexual health messages out via online provision. So, so many of them did it that way. Uh, but when they did see people coming into the services, uh, young people, they said they were seeing far fewer of them, but a much higher percentage were coming along with associated problems. It could be safeguarding issues. It could be violence. It could be because of lockdown. Um, different things have gone on that had a negative impact on their sexual and their mental health and well-being. And especially when you're looking at mental health and well-being, look at the ways in which somebody who is mentally vulnerable um, can also be sexually vulnerable as well. So certainly the sexual health services have noticed various problems um, around all of this area. Another conflicting issue is to think about what the Department for Education has said in its 2020 RSE guidance. Um, here's a message that goes across so many official documents um, on sex and relationship education or RSE, saying that parents and carers uh, are, are meant to be the prime people for delivering sex and relationship education, and that schools, in a way, are a backup to parents. Yet look what these students are saying, it's the exact opposite. So few of them are actually getting appropriate sex and relationship education uh, within their family households. And especially for those who are sexual minorities or those who were questioning uh, their gender identity, lots of those found that they had to get their, their learning outside of the home. So although official documents say it's parents that should be doing it, in reality, that, that doesn't happen as often as the documents would tend to imply. That's another important factor for you as well, because look how you may be relating to parents. Maybe you're at parents' uh, parents' evenings, and maybe you've got parents coming up to you on a one-to-one -one basis, asking about how they can talk about sexual matters with young people. But here's a proactive opportunity for you. Maybe you should be putting on sessions for parents on how to talk about um, sexual issues. <clears throat> because even when you look at the schools where there are some parents who don't want their young people going to formal RSE classes, and maybe they want to withdraw them, sometimes it may be that they haven't had accurate information in the first place, or they feel totally uneducated and unskilled in being able to talk about these issues with young people. But you only have to watch television for any any program that's on when you know when when older when parents start talking in front of their children about ending sex. Look how so many children might pull a face, or they feel as if they don't want to engage in that sort of conversation with their parents. And yet, the official documentation is saying that. So obviously, the more you can empower parents, the greater that's going to be for building up these networks together of parents, schools, young people, nursing services, all those interrelated together. The final important aspect I want to focus on here is to do with peer education. There are lots of studies coming out from various countries showing how sometimes on particular issues, especially sensitive issues, maybe around sex or mental health and well-being, that young people often prefer people near their own age to, uh, to, to, to learn from. So near peer educators is something that could be encouraged even more. And especially when you look at... Um, empowering older students in school to be able to cascade that learning down in effective ways to younger people, and especially building those as your allies so that you know then that they'll refer young people on, especially when they're concerns, they can say to the young people, please go and talk to the school nurse because they're confidential and an appropriate service to go and talk to. The next thing to consider is how to move forward. 
And there are particular ways in which I'd like to suggest this. First of all, you need to show the uh, um, commissioners of various services that you are always ready. So even though you may be on the back foot at the moment with this, don't let being on the back foot uh, be any disadvantage to you at all. So don't lose your knowledge, your skills and your ability um, to impact on relationship and sex education. So look at other ways of doing this. So maybe, for example, if teachers are struggling, as some of them are, in how to implement the new RSE guidance, maybe you could have input into the curriculum development. So even though you're not formally part of delivering it, you could be supporting others. Look at ways in which you might be able to collaborate with the new people that are doing it. Maybe it's particular charities or services that have come in to do it, and they haven't got your expertise. So they need to know it's not just a case of delivering relationships and sex, uh, relationship and sex education, but how can they refer on to you as school nurses if they find that there's a particular need to? So it means that you constantly need to keep up with your education and your skills around RSE so that you can help backfill at the moment, but that means that you're a constant presence for whenever um, new commissioning opportunities do arrive. So what you need to do is look at the ways of not reinventing the wheel, but actually keeping it spinning. And to show you this, I'd like to share with you uh, a few little tips. Now, for those of you who are vegetarians, I apologize in advance for what I'm going to say. But there's a really good comedy film called Connie and Carla. And one of them says to an audience there that if you want people to know that they're steak for supper, you've got to let them hear it sizzle. OK, so you've got to let the commissioners and the schools and the parents know that you are able and willing and ready to, to pick up around relationship and sex education. So it could be when the teachers are getting trained on how to deliver this, maybe you're going to be part of that as well. Because in the past, there was too much of an opportunity for them just to call you in to do the clinical bits. Maybe it was to talk to young people about sexual infections. Maybe they were hoping you'd be showing horrible pictures when things go wrong to try to put people off. That's not your role at all. So it's looking at ways in which you can um, uh, keep ready for be able to, uh, being able to be proactive in the delivery of this. Also, for speculating to accumulate, it's going to be really important for you to keep up your education. And although there's lots of funding shortages at the moment, and so many nurses say, well, we can't go off and do university courses because there's just not the money or the time to do it. And especially if you're not commissioned to do it, that it may be all be deprioritized. So you've got to look at ways in which you must keep speculating to accumulate here. And that shows that you're ready with your knowledge, your attitudes, your skills, and your regular habits. OK, so it's not that you're going to forget all of this just because you're not being commissioned at the moment. And for those of you who are being commissioned, make sure that you're still seen as an essential part of the RSE delivery, not just the curriculum stuff, but you are the professionals that people turn to when things do go wrong or when they want to keep them going better. And that means you have to think of new ways to work and collaborate with others. And whether that's developing um, online resources, maybe as a school nursing service, you have your own uh, part of your trust's website. So make sure that you keep a good sexual health profile on there as well. And it means that even though you're stepping back at the moment, you've got opportunities to learn of new ways to move forward. And I'd suggest that one of the greatest ways is going to be for you to look at how you can network with others. Go and visit sexual health services. Go and find out what they're saying at the moment about young people. So if they tell you that they've got limited numbers coming in, but, but those coming in have got more um, maybe mental health problems or more safeguarding issues, then look at ways in which you can proactively address that. Because your role is going to be really important around sexual health promotion and therefore preventing things when they go wrong. And you've got a wonderful opportunity to join up the dots here, to look at your clients holistically, look at the various ways that sex, sexualities, sexual health and mental health can impact on individuals. 
look at some of the messages I've got up here. It could be around contraception. It could be about female genital cutting. It could be about questioning a person's identity um, or their sexual orientation. There are so many different opportunities right across the life course of young people in school where they've got opportunities to talk to you about those. So look at joining up those dots. And here are some of the ways I think that you've got a great benefit in doing this. Firstly, as nurses, look how nursing is always seen as one of the most trusted professions. So keep that profile up. And especially in the, in, in the fallout from this COVID-19 era, look how people are still turning to nurses. Look at the great respect being shown, even though you're not seeing it in your salaries at the end of the month. But that's a different talk altogether. Also, I've already said about linking with others and showing how you can network and signpost to others. And it might mean that they'll then signpost to you as well. So various sexual health charities or sexual health and reproductive clinics might then link to school nursing services as well. Also, when you think of this term intersectionality, look how um, all of these issues showing on here link in together. That there's, that you can't take people in silos or independent of each other. So if you've got a young person, say, for example, with mental health problems, or maybe they've got low self-esteem, chances are there'll be a negative impact on their sexual health or maybe even their contraceptive awareness as well and certainly with safeguarding issues so keep on having your positive impact because you will be back um, and that's it we're coming towards the end and my contact details are there uh, i hope this video has been okay i can see the sun's been coming and going throughout the session i hope it's been okay for you feel free to contact me there's my personal twitter account or our sexual health students or our skiffin the school nursing students are on that postgraduate health website okay um and i'll be around now for questions afterwards thank you so much for your attention